Anybody know why I titled this that? <laughs> Honestly, the only reason is I had that song go through my head. <laughs> Thank 
Well, there's a very important reason. These are group 15 products. If you're doing a layer of residual programming in your soybean, you got about a 98% likelihood of using what group of herbicide in your layer of residual.
I've never made one recommendation in 29 years that would ever increase in farmers' yield by one bush. I'm a yield preservationist, right? We're trying to manage these alternative plant species that have the exact same resource requirements as a soybean plant. And those resources that these alternate vegetation uses are resources the crop can't use to try to express that genetic potential. So, the importance of these things have changed again over time. I don't know where we are right now, probably, I would guess 60, maybe 70 percent of our soybean acres in the state now have a visibility. I think we can really begin talking a lot about that. There's one way to reduce the evolution of resistance to foliar fly is simply reduce the number of plants that are exposed to that foliar fly, right? Folks, resistance evolution is nothing more than a number. Okay. The more things that are exposed to it in these dioecious species, that's why we talk about that every single time. Um, foundation watering program, we first started right now, this is the first guy to ever grow the water in 1997. So you got to be a little copy of the dogs. Um, remember when I told you that I had to might have modified that slide in like uh, 13 years? But then I had to add that new that to the bottom. So how is persistence? The soil applied herbicide plant. And is manifest differently at fruit plant application time, at plant, or with a layer of residual. And some of the labels, if you look at these, will say, okay, if you're in a high residue environment, whether it be corn stalks or cover crops, that rate should probably be bumped up. That will help to some extent. But what does every residual herbicide need in order to work effectively? It needs water. Right? We've got to get it off the surface. We've got to get it in the solution. And we can't do that mechanically. The importance of that rainfall event, hopefully within about a week. That's all we've got to rely on. So that herbicide will wash off the residue. It is. Now I can't remember what question I asked you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter. But that's 
sounds stupid to me. If you spend all that extra money, if you don't use it. So why are we doing this? Do you want your soil applied herbicides to only control something at one point during the season? No, you know, you want that four weeks, right? Or five weeks or whatever you can get out of it. That is why these rates are where they are. Folks, there, I know of no label of a soil applied product with the rate structure ever based on one of these species. Reasonable. Why do they structure the rates? Well, you've got soil type, you've got organic matter, and you have your spectrum. You're trying to pick a rate for these products that gives you that broad spectrum of control for X number of weeks. So we get into these arguments about rates, right? There is no one rate of these products. That's the market rate. Okay. Uh, John may want five weeks of residual, so he's going to pick a rate. Stan may want only three weeks. Those are different rates. Okay. But it's really important now, hopefully when you see that, that really starts to make a lot more sense. Think about this at planting time. Okay. Showed you that slide with group 15 stuff in 28 days. Those were sprayed the exact same thing. Which one lasts longer? Certainly don't sense it. Think about that in your layer of residual. Do you water that, right? I mean, do we really think that the practices or principles of residual herbicides can ever be on the application of them? You gotta get it in the solution. <coughs> Well, sure, so I didn't do 
met you back then. I'm fit to meet you now. Why are you doing it now? Why are you forcing me? That dietitious nature of these things, forcing these changes. All right. Now, where are we going with this? Well, hopefully it's quick. Uh, I'm going to do the size and so if you're through, everybody get comfortable using these group numbers for the size. And it's kind of a, not really a recent thing, but I think more and more you're seeing these being used. Okay, group 2 AOS vendors, group 14 PPOs, group 15 past advocates. Is there resistance in our waterhead populations to these? The answer, of course, is yes. How about group 5? Both system 2 inhibitors. Is there resistance in our population? The answer is yes <coughs> and no. Can I make up my mind? Where are we going with this? Remember the title of this presentation? Hold on back. All right. I digress for a moment, but we have to. We use two types of triazine herbicides in the world. One type we call the symmetrical, the other type we call the asymmetrical. I guess we didn't come up with any sexier names than that. Symmetrical, all that means is that the nitrogen atoms in that phenol ring are symmetrically distributed about that ring. All evidence. Do the best examples we have of symmetrical triazines have been intrinsic. Asymmetricals, you see, those nitrogens are not symmetrically distributed around that The best example we have there is metrics. Right, okay, with right. Now, to go along with two types of triazines. We also have two types of triazine resistance mechanisms. And this is not just in one. Um, one that we first characterized was what's called a target site resistance. When I say target site resistance, here's what I mean. Every herbicide has at least one point, one place, one target it goes to in that plant. That's what it locks on, that's what it shuts down, that's why the plant dies. When I say target site resistance, something has happened to that target site. It's somehow changed now. It's changed to where that herbicide either can no longer bind at all, or it can't bind as efficiently as it once did on itself. So the first case of this actually, the hardest target site resistance to rising actually was put back in the early 80s. What happened is, this is actually, it's not in uh, water, it's actually in soup paper. So what they found is that there's a parkside mutation, one single nucleotide polymorphism. What that means is there's one thing, one amino <coughs> acid change in the coding region of that target. One little amino acid, you take three amino acids to make a coat okay? One was changed, and now all of a sudden you can't kill those plants with 100 pounds of atrium. And yes, I have sprayed 100 pounds of atrium in the greenhouse. Plants eventually do die, but they die because you're shaking leaves and so much white stuff. That can <laughs> Don't try that. All right. Typically, again, this target site typically confers what we call high level of resistance. Okay. Remember those ratios I showed you earlier for group 15 stuff? Those were talking. When we're talking high, we're talking hundreds, 500 fold, 1,000 fold, 3,000 fold. Right. That's one high. There's also another type. If the first one was target site based, this is all non target site. All right? It's anything that doesn't necessarily involve the herbicide target site per se. The target site has not changed, but something else has. Mm -hmm. There's the, I don't know if you can read it back, there's a thing called a Phoenix phenomenon. Anybody ever heard that? Remember what legendary Phoenix was? Kind of rose from the ashes. Dragon looking thing or bird looking thing. All right, there's giant ragweed in Ontario, Canada. That's resistant to glyphosate. How is it resistant? Well, you spray the plants and literally within hours, guess what happens? The leaves drop off. Why do the leaves drop off? Where's all the glyphosate at? It's in the leaves. Drop the leaves off, a few days later, sprout out new leaves, you get the phoenix effect. That is a non cardicide mechanism of resistance. Right? Um, it could be reduced absorption, you just can't get the stuff in there. 
you may get it in there and all of a sudden the plant just may stick it somewhere where it can't reach that far. That's another one. But the one that we're working on right now is what we call metabolic resistance. So in other words, these plants are now basically chewing these things up so quickly. That is not the enhanced metabolism right now. Each one of these has two different lengths. This is a two hour treatment and four hour treatment. So at two hours and four hours, do you see any difference in the intensity of that grid? And I apologize to anybody who's colorblind, but that's it. There's a difference. What happens between two hours and four hours? Yeah. If the intensity suggests how much still remains its parent, how much is remaining in the parent in four hours? Not very much, right? That's why you don't go more, but that's the problem. So where does this go? Down here. Those are metabolites. Okay. So that core plant has somehow figured out how to break that molecule down to where it's not popular. Right? Look that. Alright, that's corn. Here's two resistant populations of corn. What do you see of the intensity of those bands in four hours? Pretty much like corn. Okay. That was our clue that this is enhanced metabolism to group 15 products. These things, folks, are behaving just like the four inch plant ground. Here's two sensitive ones. Why are they sensitive? Can't break it down. Yeah. Alright, what's the So, what is the big deal now about two types of triazine for symmetrical acid and two types of triazine resistance means? Alright. Target site. Remember that? Change, actual physical change in that target site. Target site resistance typically confers resistance to symmetrical and asymmetrical triazines. So when you have a target site based mechanism, Atrex is not going to work. Tricor is not going to work. Alright, we do that. Okay. Um, however, here's the good news for it. Most instances of triazine resistance. Water at least today is not target site based. Why is it not target site based? Well, in virtually every instance of target site based triazine resistance, it comes with what's called a fitness chemical because of where that mutation takes place. It's in a photosynthetic apparatus, right? Photosynthesis is kind of important to a green plant. It, Confers resistance to atrazine, but in the absence of atrazine, okay, these plants are kind of like the runt of the living. They don't grow as fast, they don't grow as big, they don't make as much seed. Okay, now picture in your mind this is your field in 2022 that hasn't been sprayed. It's middle of May, water is starting to emerge. How many plants are going to be in this area right here on the stable? It's not a fair question. Let me say one. Let me say thousands. Thousands. If I'm the runt in the litter and the only one in there, what's my likelihood I'm going to be able to make it? Zero. I'm not going to pass that very on in future generations. Right? So, non cardiocyte resistance, and here again we're talking specifically enhanced metabolism, at least currently in our populations is specific to cement. Atrazine is not going to work. Princess is not going to work. Metrofusion will work. Okay. Is that because we use more atrazine? We have no idea. I will be completely honest with you. We have time for that. We'll do that. So here's the question we asked a couple of years ago. How effective is metrofusion, metrofusion be on population resistant from actually herbicides for 60 defendants? Remember we said what happens to you when you your residual control with resistance to soil life? It's less and less, right? If we have resistance now, let's say, to a PTO chemistry, our biological authorities, how are they going to look in comparison with metrics that still is going to be about? Because we know this population is rising resistant, but it's not hard side based. Okay. Good. Alright. So Thank you. 20 minutes get the horse and hot sorry. Um, 2019 to 2020, here in Champaign County, North Sydney, 
Providing a sale on PH55, 4.4% organic matter. Please remember those values that are become important at the end of this conversation. All right? 5.5 pH, 4.4% organic matter. We picked Tricor just because we had it. It's a 75 DF. If you remember, Sencor, like some days, at the same formulation, 75 DF. And he said, well, what rate? Well, okay. We put 16 rates out, and they were at one ounce increments. We started with one ounce of product, and we went all the way to 16. We didn't want to get some. We had authority that we used. We picked what I call a rate, like a quarter pound active, which is what you get in a lot of previews, somewhere in that ballpark. And then this 0.313, that's about the highest rate that you can get with any sulfentrazone zone containing product. So, June 10th and uh, June 2nd, 20, very true beans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Replicated three times. Digital estimates of control, we made those at two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks after planting. Mm -hmm. Right? Planted is great signal. I think we actually planted first and spread at the top. Okay. We're on the same page. What do we want to do? I didn't really want to show you 18 bars on bar graph. That sucks. And the statisticians hate that. So what I did is I grouped these rates together. I actually averaged over some of these rates. So here you're looking at the results of 14 days, 28 days, and 42 days after planning. So all the white bars at each stage evaluation, that's the average control from our one to five ounce rates. You can see the number up there at the top of the bar. The blue bar is the average control of six to nine ounces. Orange is in 16, and the two rates of sulfendrazone are in the green. What do you notice what stands out to you at 14 days, if anything? Maybe that's not the right question. What's the most common rate of tricor or syncor that folks are willing to use these days? Five to six ounces. Okay. <clears throat> Worth money in 14 days? We can do that. How about that six to nine ounce rate? That's a little better. Why would you go with this rate? Actually, it's pretty long to pull the for you to get this a two weeks, right? What happened to four weeks? What are you seeing right here? A shorter residual activity. All the ones that were up at 28 days were resistant. We don't really need to talk about that part anymore. Well, that blue and orange. Anybody get that level of water in control a month later these days? Quite honestly, folks, at 10 to 16, there was no difference in those rates. You don't need 16 ounces. No pain was one. 42 days out, you still hold either 80 or 90 percent control. I didn't think that was too bad. You're able to see pictures of the bars. Here we go. That's the high rate of the This was in 2020, so that's, that's six weeks out. There's the pound for you don't need a pound correct. Is this going to work on every acre? Probably not. Is it the only thing you need on every acre? I don't know. <clears throat> but we might be able to look at it here, folks. So, good and effective option. Even for those that are resistant to atrazine, by the way, in that population was resistant to you know, herbicides from six classes, so HDP didn't work, EPO didn't work. It was rising, that's surprising. Based on recent life stage, it works there at 21. Uh, appropriate rate is going to be necessary. Five ounce rating, okay. I don't want your bird down, but not turn to the end of the And again, at 10 ounces, it didn't even much more than that. Still 90% after six weeks. I was just curious, I went back and I looked. Remember, I started this out at 96, I told you it was a good podcast. We had a trial in Bond County in 96, looking at two rates of sulfenic zone, one was at 0.313. Okay. So six weeks after planning in these, these trials, you know, the authority rates 40% control of the long time. Okay, six weeks. 25 years ago, in Bond County, at the same rates, we were still over 90%. That's what's happening. <clears throat> and I know you're just dying to ask this. Everybody is. First question is always what about anything? Can you tell me what about anything? Uh, 
It hasn't changed. Okay. Can land abuse still intervene? Yep, sure can. Nothing changed there. All of you know, hasn't changed since it was first brought to market. Do you have sense of variety? I suspect there's still there's. I have no idea how common this is in modern terms. My guess is, based on conversations with folks in the industry and a couple of universities that are dual screening, we all think it's less common than what it was 30 or 40 years ago. Is it still there? Yeah. Is it as common? Probably not. So that's one way to think about it. pH organic matter. What were those values from that field I asked you to remember? 5.5 and 4.4. Okay. Metabolism, availability, increases with increasing soil pH. If you're 7 or above, ignore everything I've just told you for the last 30 minutes. Do not do that. You do not want to put metabolism on high pH ground. You never have, right? Anybody ever put metabolism down on the gravel road? That's where you can see it. The high pH right? gravel road. High affinity for organic matter. Back was 4.4. Folks, I've never one time, even at 16 ounces of metabolism for three years, I've ever had any sort of response on that Do not let me fool you. That's not going to hold across the entire state. But here's one thing I like to think about. Those of you with a little gray hair like I do you probably remember the days when we sprayed a lot more metrics and all sorts of Right? Let's go back to the years. If you think back to where you typically saw a lot of metrics and injury on soybeans 40 years ago, where in the field did you commonly see that? There's two spots. Headlands and overlaps. Right? Okay. Why do you see that on the headlands and the overlap? Well, before we answer that question, what rate of accuracy were we using four years ago? Four pounds, five pounds, five especially more than one quack rack. That's all you really had, right? Here's another question for you. What were you spraying these fields with four years ago? They have a pickup truck sprayer. How good were you with that? A good song on the radio? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I'm an idiot when it comes to equipment, but I'm guessing that today's modern sprayers are a bit more effective in terms of reducing oak out. I think people get these things up with their hands on the street. All right. My point is this 40 years ago, we were using a lot more atrazine than we use today. If we overlap three pounds of Atrex, now we're at six pounds, right? If we did not grade our spray skills over that winter and we're now putting on 10 ounces of sink for the next year, do you think you're going to have that? Probably. So now you got six pounds of Atrex last year, you got 20 ounces of sink for this year. No wonder you saw. Okay? Atrazine rates are much lower than what they were. Right? And two and a half pounds is most of the acre we put on. That part of the equation is different. Application equipment is much different these days. And again, we think that the sensitivity is not quite as common as what it used to be. So a lot of these factors that 40 years ago played into a lot of soybean response to metrics. It may not all be as critical today. One last piece of evidence for this. These are atrazine degradation curves from soils. These are soils in this column right here that have no history of atrazine use. You're looking at fine and taste, or 50% of this atrazine can be created in these soils. Okay, for example, here's a soil from Iowa. It took 47 days for half of that atrazine to break in. This column is in soils that have a history of atrazine use. And here's one from Illinois, half life there, two and a half days. Folks, we've got soils here on the south part that we've used for years in annual rotations, half life of atoms in there, about eight and I have no idea how common this is, but I suspect it's more common than that common. So that part of the thing of the equation is much less as well. Do you know what this is? What one is a soybean meat, right? A soybean. <laughs> um, well, let me try this. Anybody ever see that before? What is that? 
all worked up about after the fact. I mean, we haven't lit up this state for like five consecutive years with PPO damage. It's not something that we have to see. All right, that's how you do it. Any questions?